Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Norton for her talk today. So uh, Elizabeth and I were just figuring out that we've worked together, uh, you know, with about eight years together. Uh, uh, so Elizabeth got her uh, bachelor's degree at Dartmouth in, quite impressively, language and brain development as a, a self-designed special major. Uh, then went to Tufts, where she earned her PhD with Marianne Wolf, but a lot of her work was in our laboratory, uh, and has been a postdoctoral fellow uh, at MIT for the last uh, four years or so, supported uh, for the last couple of years uh, by uh, the, the uh, Schwinn Family Postdoctoral Fellowship through the Simons Foundation. And um, now she is going to have the excitement of setting up her own uh, laboratory as an independent faculty member at Northwestern University uh, in September. So she's done a terrific job. So I do want to say two different things, one professionally and then <laughs> personal comment uh, before Elizabeth starts. Uh, so professionally, uh, Elizabeth has done remarkable work. Actually, today's is a different line of research than most of the work we've done together, but, it, it, uh, but it's been a focus in the last year and a half. Uh, most of the work we've done together has been on uh, an amazing study that, that, that Elizabeth has led, looking at nearly uh, 2,000 local kindergartners from a huge diversity of schools, attempting to use uh, behavioral and, and imaging methods to identify which kindergarten will learn to read successfully or fail to read successfully before they ever start to get reading instruction. So that early identification might lead to early intervention and more children learning to read. So it's an amazing study in terms of its range, uh, in terms of its uh, relationships with teachers, schools, and parents, in terms of its uh, brain imaging and ERP. Elizabeth has pretty much uh, led the ERP component of our lab for the last couple of years together with a, with a couple of other postdoctoral fellows. So uh, she's just done an, an amazing job. It's a sort of an epic uh, research study in many ways and, and, and widely noted and followed. And on top of that, uh, she's engaged in this sort of cutting edge methodological research that you're about to hear today, combining uh, high temporal resolution and relatively high spatial resolution methods to better understand face processing in regards to in relation to autism. So it's a very strong and remarkable research uh, uh, record of accomplishment. And not surprising that it landed Elizabeth such a desirable uh, position at Northwestern. The last thing I want to say is uh, uh, it's just a treat to have Elizabeth as a collaborator. She's wonderfully generous, supportive to everybody, uh, mentors students really nicely. Uh, many of us, including me, go to her all the time for all kinds of help. And she's always, uh, helps everybody generously, thoughtfully, skillfully. And it's just she's a phenomenal uh, person and a, and a citizen of a laboratory. And, and we're a little jealous of that Northwestern will get to enjoy that, both Elizabeth Norton as a scientist and Elizabeth as a person. So uh, now she's going to talk about uh, this, this uh, new line of research, which is very exciting, I think, in its uh, attempt to, to use uh, technical tools at their limits uh, with humans. And Elizabeth, uh, we look forward to hearing you talk. Introduction. Um, can everyone hear me okay in the back of the room there? Yes, okay. Um, so as John mentioned, um, I come from sort of a background of being interested in the brain and what it can tell us about child development and in particular about developmental disorders. So my research program really combines um, different brain, brain imaging methodologies, methodologies, MRI and EEG, and really with the goal of trying to solve some very long-standing behavioral research problems in the field. So both autism and dyslexia are disorders in which we sort of must wait for children to fail at something until they can get a diagnosis. And in both cases, we know that early intervention would be better than waiting for children to fail. So the goal of my bigger research program, and even though this research in autism is with adults, the goal is eventually to be able to move it down for, to children to look for markers in the brain that might already be there that could help us identify which children are going to benefit from early intervention and help them from um, the gaps that they experience in their peers, whether in reading or in social and, um, and autism-related um, traits. So I'm going to tell you about some research today. Um, my Simon Center uh, postdoctoral fellowship project where I use simultaneous EEG fMRI to characterize human face processing in space and time. One of the things that I've always found sort of amazing is that there's a very innate uh, specialization for human faces among babies. So within an, hour, within an hour of birth, in their very first moments of visual experience, 
human infants already show a specialization and a preference for looking at faces. So they prefer to look at that face that you see on the left versus similar um, configurations of parts moved around already within an hour of birth. So this is something really innate and really truly special about human face processing. It's different from other types of visual processing. And because this is such a robust phenomenon, it's there so early and so strongly, we can use brain imaging to measure this, this uh, special face response. However, in autism, there are some differences in face processing. There's been a lot of attention to this because face processing is there so early, as opposed to, say, social reciprocity or uh, turn-taking, things like this that are also apparent in autism. There's a lot of interest in studying face processing because it could be a very early marker, because that social skill is there so early. So behavioral and brain imaging studies have looked at the brain response to faces in autism, and there have been really conflicting results. So some of the, the brightest minds in autism and in brain imaging research, including many in our own uh, department here, have turned their attention to this. And even the strongest studies with the best equipment, the best uh, methods, and people have found really conflicting results. And so this is another thing that drew me to this area of research. However, if we can sort of solve this problem, if we can characterize what the differences are in face processing and autism, this could allow us to give earlier and more accurate diagnosis, as I mentioned. It could also be a good way to evaluate intervention efficacy and perhaps to just get a better understanding of the etiology of this sort of complex disorder that we don't really know the precise origin of. So today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about EEG and fMRI for those of you who might not be familiar with it talk about the findings in face processing and typical development in autism, talk a little bit about why uh, we chose simultaneous EEG fMRI for this project, and then show you some data on the EEG alone, the fMRI alone, and then a little bit how we've been trying to bring these two things together. So first, EEG stands for electroencephalography. This is a way of measuring the natural electrical signals of the brain that arise from neurons firing in synchrony. Um, so it gives us very precise information about the timing processes of the brain with excellent temporal resolution. The system that we use here um, records uh, 500, uh, 500 measurements per second. So we have excellent, excellent uh, temporal resolution. However, there's poor spatial localization because of the uh, electrical activity um, is summed over space and it's also blurred through the scalp and through the skull. So we can get a general idea of where activation might be recurring um, and save for using methods like Loretta for localization. We can't get a great idea about where things are happening in space, but we get excellent temporal information. And we look at ERPs, which are event-related potentials. So these are a time-locked response to a certain stimulus. So I could, from the sort of stream of uh, continuous EEG data, I would mark in precisely in time when I showed different types of stimuli or the different instances of the same type of stimuli and average those together. And the ERP waveform has sort of this canonical pattern across different types of stimuli, uh, visual and auditory, um, where you get a, a first a positive peak, then a negative peak, positive, negative, and so on. Um, and just as a convention in this type of research, negative is usually plotted up. It's an old historical thing that I like to stick with because I'm interested in mostly negative components and it looks negative. <laughs> So the canonical, the sort of standard response that we look at in terms of faces is called the N170. And so this is a negative going component that occurs about 170 milliseconds with some flexibility in time, um, depending on the conditions of the experiment. And it's most pronounced over right posterior temporal and occipital electrodes. So over where we would expect the, um, the MRI face uh, response as well. And it's thought to be generated by both those occipital uh, regions and also by some cortex in the superior temporal sulcus. And the, there's also some, uh, the other component that we look at is the P1, so the first sort of positive component, because that's earlier around 100 milliseconds, that's reflecting more general sensory perceptual processes, maybe detecting that that is a face, versus the N170 is more uh, further downstream, more uh, recognition of the individual's identity um, and things like that. So then, and it grows with expertise. You also get this same development of an N170 to words, however, only after experience. The N170, the faces, is there from birth because we have this specialized category for faces, but it does develop with time for words after children learn to read. 
And so in autism, the P1 and the N170 components, again, this literature is hugely mixed, but when there are differences found, they tend to occur later and be reduced in amplitude relative to what's seen in controls. Um, but as I mentioned, a huge heterogeneity in the literature. And there's also an interesting characteristic where the response to inverted versus upright faces is often larger in controls, <coughs> but equivalent in ASD. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. This is a feature in my experiment as well. Switching to fMRI now for functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, this is looking at changes in blood flow to the brain, so the time course is much more protracted. We're waiting for uh, areas of the brain to use uh, glucose, oxygen, nutrients, and then those needed to be replenished by an, uh, an increase in blood flow. So the time course is on the order of 8 to 10 seconds. However, the spatial information is much more precise. We have a lot better spatial resolution. Um, so the idea of combining these things can get us some complementary information. Um, and as Nancy Kenwisher and her colleagues uh, pioneered, uh, there's an area called the fusiform face area in the right uh, fusiform gyrus that shows increased activation to phases <coughs> versus all types of other stimuli, even those that one is an expert in, such as bird watchers, response to birds, any type of other thing that has sort of a similar diversity to faces, faces are still uh, special and unique in this area. And in addition to activation in the fusiform face area, uh, faces also elicit activation in the lateral occipital region and the superior temporal sulcus. So we'll keep an eye out for those as well in the data that I show you. And activation in general is slightly right lateralized, um, but it does show up bilaterally. And in autism, the research suggests um, again, that the FFIA activation is usually reduced in autism relative to controls, but some studies find no differences, and recently sort of consensus, I think, has been building that there's not a huge qualitative difference in the way phases are processed in the brain in individuals with autism, but rather maybe sort of a more minor quantitative difference, which again could be due to a lot of differences between groups that um, they exist in the scanner. So for example, patient populations are more likely to have head motion, which has now been shown to uh, definitively affect the fMRI signal. There may be differences in the individual's face memory or face perception ability between groups that could affect these things. So we're very interested in uh, accounting for those in our data. And as I mentioned again, the face inversion effect which we'll be looking at. Um, so both for uh, when we show inverted faces rather relative to upright faces, there's reduced behavioral performance and memory ability in typically developing individuals, reduced FFA activation, and a greater ERP N170 in the previous literature. So suggesting perhaps it's more effortful to make these decisions or more surprising, something along those lines. So how might we resolve these many discrepancies that we see in the field looking at face processing and autism related to typical development? So one thing that we can do is control for factors such as IQ, age, gender, and face perception ability. The other thing that we can do, I hope, to resolve this is to measure EEG and MRI in the same subjects at the same time. So simultaneous EEG fMRI is a technology that hasn't been around very long. Uh, and the reason this isn't done very often is because, well, I'll tell you about the advantages first. The reason we might want to do this is that we can measure both technologies under the exact, for the exact same stimuli under the exact same conditions. So as opposed to having a person come in, do an MRI scan, come back on another day, or after that do an EEG, even for the same uh, exact stimuli, the, the person's going to be in a slightly different mental state, one that they might be tired, anything like that. So ideally if we can eliminate some of those things, that would be great. We can analyze single time trial space and time relationships on those exact same stimuli. And this takes less time. It's somewhat easier for the participant than doing two separate studies. <coughs> there are some drawbacks to this. And the biggest one is that the MRI creates huge artifacts in the EEG data that we need to deal with. Um, so it, both the MRI magnetic gradients and the RF pulses create artifact. And there's also a ballistic <coughs> radiogram from the heartbeat um, affecting the movement of the um, or the electrodes on the scalp relative to the brain. So we need to be able to control for these. Um, you also have to have specialized equipment that is MRI safe and is an additional cost. And so this isn't done very much. And so this is actually the first study to use simultaneous EEG fMRI to look at autism, and only the second to look at this processing. 
So I think that this is especially promising for use in autism <coughs> because of the complexity and the heterogeneity of individuals with autism and because there's so much, there's such a lack of clarity um, in previous studies. And so the features of the project that I've sort of pointed out along the way are that we really carefully developed our protocol for scanning, um, for working with participants and the stimuli that we've used. We've also uh, collected simultaneous resting state that Susan Whitfield Gabrielli and I are looking at. I um, won't have time to talk about today, but another thing we're very interested in. Um, we have structural MRI data that's really beautiful, and we've really carefully characterized the groups and matched them. So to say a little bit more about this, um, our stimuli are engaging naturalistic faces, both upright and inverted, as well as shoes. A lot of previous studies have used either cars or houses as their control stimuli. And if you think about both cars and houses, they both have a little bit of a face-like configuration. The cars even sort of have the headlights and the grill that can look like a face, or a house sometimes has two windows and a door that can look a little face-ish. And so we piloted some different types of stimuli. We looked at chairs, and we landed on shoes that are sort of a similar range of difference in the same way that faces can be, um, but are not really at all face-like. Uh, we also have a very careful and thoughtful um, protocol for working with adults with autism. So the setup for this project is pretty intensive. It takes us almost as long to set up the participant as to scan them. So getting this cap on, getting perfect impedances, getting everything in order, um, and then getting that to stay perfect once we move them across the hall into the MRI is a huge, huge um, obstacle and something that we've worked really hard on to optimize so that we can get good data from these participants with autism. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, we're recording really high uh, temporal resolution EEG, um, and that's very precisely time locked with the MRI. So the participants in the study, we had 11 um, subjects with usable data after much, much, much piloting. Um, and they're all males because of the gender disparity in autism. It's very difficult to find females with autism, and we wanted to be able to match one to one. So we're starting the project with just males. Um, they're ages 22 to 39. That's by design that we know the face, uh, face processing mechanisms in the brain are still developing. The chemistry lab has shown up until the early 20s, and so we wanted to make sure that everyone was sort of on the same page developmentally as much as possible. They're all right-handed because there can be lateralization differences in um, the FFA in individuals who are left-handed. And the groups of typically developing and autism participants are matched on age, IQ, and crucially on face perception and memory. All of the individuals with autism have received an independent diagnosis um, and qualify on the ADOS as well. And I will say that they are all generally quite high functioning individuals because to be able to come in and be comfortable with this whole process to go in the scanner, we sort of have this trade off of we have to look at the individuals who are on the, the most high functioning end of the autism spectrum to be able to do the study. Um, and AJ has helped us a lot with that and talking a lot about which subjects would be comfortable and able to give us good data, um, yet who also definitely still qualify for a diagnosis of autism spectrum. So the measures that we use were the weights, verbal and nonverbal IQ. We also give the Cambridge Face Memory Test, which is a computerized test where individuals um, look at uh, upright faces, both uh, typical faces and faces that are blurred by noise. And they have a match to target uh, condition, a delayed <coughs> memory condition, and then a match uh, delayed in noise condition. So sort of increasing in difficulty. And they also do the match to target and the delayed memory with inverted faces as well. The match to target <coughs> inverted in noise, or the delayed in inverted in noise is impossible. So to avoid uh, frustrating participants, we just didn't administer it. <laughs> um, the next measure that everyone gets is the um, autism quotient questionnaire from Baron Cohen and colleagues. And so this is just a self-report measure. Um, participants endorse a number of items, things like I find myself drawn more strongly to people than to things, or I tend to have very strong interests which I get upset about if I can't pursue. So this gets a score and a higher score indicates more autism-like traits. And finally, we give them a background questionnaire asking about their development and a number of other um, characteristics. So I want to go back to, for a moment to show you the challenges we faced with the MRI artifact and the EEG. Um, when <coughs> I was developing this project, I hadn't actually done any simultaneous EEG fMRI before. And the first session that I collected with uh, Kana and our lab and our colleagues, uh, the first time I saw the scanner turn on while I was collecting EEG, mm -hmm. I about fainted. Mm -hmm. so the, it, the artifact is so <coughs> So what I'm going to show you is the 
uh, sort of what it looks like coming across the screen of the regular EEG, and you'll definitely see when the scanner comes on. So this is what EEG looks like, and that's what it looks like when the scanner starts acquiring images. So uh, the, in just the EEG, the, the deflections of uh, those peaks and valleys are maybe about 30 microvolts, and when you if you zoom out enough that you can actually see the peaks and valleys under the MRI, they're about 3,000 microvolts. Mm -hmm. So we're obscuring our data by about 100 times. So the challenge of getting any data in this situation is huge. <coughs> so be, be impressed when I show you this. <laughs> I'll show you one more example of this. So uh, this is a video I took. Uh, uh, so this is a scalp montage showing the impedances of the electrodes. So this is the person's nose and ears, and this is the 32 electrodes on the person's head. They're in the scanner, and we're just checking you know, that the impedances are good. So they're not so good at these two electrodes up here, but they're already in the scanner. They've got their head wrapped in pre-wrap, and they're all settled in there. So at this point, we just sort of go with it. But this is what happens then when we turn <coughs> on the scanner. That's what the electrodes start. Doing. The impedances go all over the place. Um, it looks a little bit like a Christmas tree. <laughs> uh, lights going all off. So again, just the, this effect that the MRI uh, puts on the EEG is, is huge. And um, I, I thought insurmountable, but it turns out it's not completely. Um, so when we, are, when we analyze these EEG, we use the Brain Vision Analyzer software that come, that's the same company that makes our cap. Um, and they have proprietary filters that they use to minimize that scanner artifact. We also go through and mark the, pro the pulse um, to be able to remove the impact of the cardioballistic artifact on the EEG. And then we do sort of a standard ERP analysis after that with standard filters. So a little bit more about our stimuli and our task. So in a lot of face processing studies, you see um, the stimuli are sort of standardized black and white faces with all the hair cut off, the people look sort of scary. Um, and I really wanted to get at what face processing is like in the real world, and that's not the kind of thing that we uh, tend to see in the real world. You don't often have to recognize someone without seeing their hair. You don't usually have to recognize them as sort of a neutral or angry expression. So I wanted to use pretty naturalistic stimuli, and so the Sinha Lab shared some stimuli with us, and we. Um, added to this database of uh, non-American celebrities. So, does anybody recognize any of these folks? Maybe if you're not from the U.S. Perfect. So I tested that. Every, all those stimuli <laughs> were uh, were rated by uh, individuals to make sure that they weren't recognizable. So, this is an Argentinian actor, a French actress, and an Australian singer. So, they all all of the photos the people were generally sort of good looking because they're celebrities. Um, and engaging. So if you're in the scanner and you sort of hate this process and these people would put this stuff on your head, hopefully you're at least going to attend well to this time. Um, and so Mayura Maria Ruiz very carefully went through and removed all the background and the hair and centered the images in the view uh, so, such that the fixation cross landed right between the eyes on each person. So there's been some discrepancy and uh, face processing and individuals with autism and maybe they're looking in different places. So this was designed to um, help them fixate in the, uh, in the eyes and be some more similar to the typically developing subjects. We also had shoes of all sort of varieties and configurations done with Zappos, Zappos. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the faces, we also showed the same faces, same types of faces inverted. And so there are about 120 of each stimulus type, upright faces, inverted faces, um, and shoes. And they're presented as part of a one-back design in blocks. <coughs> so the participant receives stimuli consecutively and just press a button if a, if a stimulus was repeated identically just to make sure that they were on task and awake and, uh, and attending to the stimuli. The stimuli were presented for 300 milliseconds. And each time that was randomly jittered within the MRI TR to make sure that there were not the same effect of the MRI TR uh, on the stimulus. And these were presented at only two six-minute runs, which is a pretty short amount of time for compared to a lot of similar studies. A lot of times people are doing five eight-minute runs or eight six-minute runs or things like this. We had to keep this pretty short so that the participants would be awake and not want to discontinue the experiment. <coughs> so again, when we had any data, I was thrilled. <laughs> so now to the data. 
so the ERPs to the upright faces, so these are the 32 different electrodes, they're just here arranged in alphabetical order, but the thing that's nice is that you can see even from this far away, these little bumps here are the P1 and the N170. So this is just a typically developing group with the scanner off, this sort of shows a sanity check that faces elicited an N170, you know, on a Tuesday at MIT, and um, so we get good uh, standard ERP responses. Uh, here in the full sample, all of the autism and typical group put together, this is what the scalp plot looks like. So here you're looking down from the top of the head with the nose and the ears. Here you're looking at the back of the head. Um, from before the stimulus occurs, you can see, again, sanity check, we're near zero. And then once the stimuli has been presented, the faces, you get the early positivity right here, the P1, and then the slightly later uh, bilateral negativity, the N170. And again, it's a little bit greater on the right, just like we would expect. So these stimuli are indeed eliciting the canonical N170. This is what a single waveform looks like. So this is at location O2, right on the back of the head on the right. And again, we have this beautiful P1, beautiful N170, nice and clear in the typical group. So now the question is, how does the typical group look relative to the autism group? And how does this look once we turn the scanner on? So here I've got four different things plotted. So they take you through it. We have the typical group with the scanner on in black, as I just showed you. And then once we turn the scanner on those data, the typical group is in red. So you can see we have the same pattern, and through the P1, it's very similar. But you do get an attenuated N170, just because of the noise and the filtering that goes in um, from the scanner uh, in the typical group. And then the autism group with the scanner off in blue and scanner on in green um, look quite similar. And we do get the P1 and the N170, you get the right pattern, but it is quite attenuated. <coughs> so this is a plot of the scanner off versus on amplitudes of the N170. So scanner off here is on the x-axis, and a, a more negative N170 is, is a stronger response. And here's the scanner on. And you can see that the correlation is pretty good. It's about 0.5, and there's no significant difference in a paired samples t-test of the individual's activation or uh, amplitude with the scanner off versus on. And you do see there's sort of a spread of individuals without autism in blue and with autism in green um, through the through all the data. So again, this is good. We we can get some good data with the scanner on. So now I want to turn to the EEG for that upright uh, versus inverted faces effect. Yes, um, If I may ask, scanner off does not mean in this case that there are no artifacts, because being in there, and uh, you still get the body so cardiogram and, and other artifacts. Turning the scanner on, for me at least, it seems that you, um, you're activating the RF coils and the gradients, which introduce a different type of noise. Um, do you want to comment in terms of how noisy you think the scanner off data is, and why would you observe this thing? Sure, so this is a good point, that these people are laying down in the scanner with, um, with so not really typical EEG conditions, even for the scanner off condition. So the, as you saw in the, when I was showing the, how it looks when you turn the scanner on, you do just get a huge disruption of the data. I think that the data look good such that we can be pretty assured that this is a, an N170 and we are getting you know, a robust N170 with a scanner off and typical, so I feel pretty good about that. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, so now turning to the, sh the upright faces versus shoes. So this is now um, faces minus shoes for the two groups with the scanner off. The scanner on looks similar, but again, things just tend to be a little bit attenuated. So you can see that the typical group has a much greater N170 to faces than to shoes, as we'd expect, as well as a greater P1. Whereas you see, again, a little bit of the same pattern, a dip for the P1 and a peak for the N170, but sort of within the realm of the, the general noise in the ASD group. So essentially, there's not a lot of differentiation between faces and shoes in the ASD group relative to the typical group. Um, and then when we turn to the inverted face effect, again, we see the same sort of pattern, that you get a pronounced P1 and an N170 for the typical group, so meaning that there's a greater uh, response in those uh, time windows to faces greater than inverted faces, and not a lot of difference in the, uh, in the autism group, suggesting that they're sort of treating upright and inverted faces more similarly. Um, and now on to 
did an ANOVA looking at stimulus type versus hemisphere versus group to look at if there might be some interactions <coughs> among these things. And indeed, we find that there's an interaction of ASD group and hemisphere. So here we have the N170 amplitude again, more negative is better, however negative is plotted down this time. Um, so for the typically developing group, you see a sort of a similar level of activation to phases in the left hemisphere uh, and a, uh, a lateralization in the right for the typically developing but not the autism group. So that drives this um, interaction of group and hemisphere. And then we do see that these two uh, responses to faces in the right hemisphere in the typical group um, are typical group versus ASD group are significantly different in a t-test. So to sort of summarize the EEG part of the data, the ERPs, uh, we see that naturalistic face and shoe stimuli elicit a robust P109970 even during MR acquisition. There is a significant difference in face and inverted face N170 amplitude in the typical versus the autism groups. There's significantly greater right lateralization in the typical group to those stimuli, and there's evidence for the inversion effect in, sorry, I switched switch this, in, uh, uh, in typical development but not in autism. So we'll move on now to the fMRI data. So these were processed using FSL, Anson, FreeSurfer, and a pipeline uh, stream. We had a strict motion threshold because we wanted to make sure that there weren't differences between the groups and the amount of motion in the scanner. And so there was just one participant with autism who we had to toss one run because there was too much motion. Other than that, the participants were really still. They were re really did a great job. Um, and all of the fMRI data are corrected for multiple comparisons using Gaussian random field theory. So all of these are essentially highly thresholded, um, significant results even in this relatively small sample. So first, just to give you uh, sort of a grabbing here, this is typical development, uh, faces greater than rest. So indeed, we see this beautiful FFA uh, region and extending out into the lateral occipital region, um, right lateralized exactly as we would predict. Turning now to the autism group, you can see that there's very similar but slightly uh, less extent and intensity of activation, and it's more in the lateral occipital than in the FFA. There actually wasn't a significant activation in the FFA in the autism group here. Then if we directly compare typical greater than autism for the same phase of greater than rest condition, there's nothing at that strong statistical threshold. So in this case, like some other studies, we found that there wasn't a significant difference between autism and typical development just for faces versus rest. However, I do want to show you what it looks like when we look at a lower threshold just to see where the differences are. And they are greater a little bit in the FFA type region in the right um, for typicals and in the posterior STS. There's actually a lot of activation you can see in negative suggesting places that had greater activation for the autism group. And just sort of an interesting uh, thing to think about more in the future. And so, we're not finding a huge difference, like a lot of more recent studies that have carefully controlled the differences between their groups. Let's turn now and look at that upright versus inverted face effect. So is there a difference between uh, upright and inverted faces in typical greater than autism? So yes, you can see that here on the right in both frontal and around the STS, um, there is more activation for the typical group for the upright greater than <coughs> inverted faces and then a little bit of areas in the left hemisphere that are different for the autism group where there's greater activation for upright greater than inverted faces. However, again, there's no difference in the FFA. So these might be sort of secondary regions further down the processing pipeline. So this is something that will be interesting to look at correlating with the EEG in the future. We'll also look at faces versus shoes. And interestingly, there's quite a bilateral and extensive amount of activation where typical greater than autism have greater activation for faces to shoes. So it's almost throughout a lot of the brain, definitely uh, here in the FFA regions, in the STS, and as you can see on both sides. So now we want to look at some correlations. So not just where is activation different, but where is it related to these behavioral characteristics that we measured. So we're gonna look first at the AQ. This is the questionnaire their participants filled out. And here a higher AQ score <coughs> indicates more autism-like traits. So a negative correlation means that typical, uh, more typical development is associated with greater activation for faces greater than shoes. So again, this is quite extensive. So there were nowhere in the brain that lower AQ score was associated with higher activation 
only where more typical AQ score. And again, we see this sort of frontal IFG around the STS and near the FFA, and then a little bit of the same on the right. Now we're going to look at the Cambridge phase memory test, their phase memory measure. So this is for upright phases to a short delay in time. So how good are you at remembering faces, and how does that correlate with faces greater than rest? So we have the positive correlations here, you actually get some frontal activation, and then negative correlations here, so worse face memory was associated with some areas on the left, and a little bit of posterior occipital um, activation. And so that's faces versus rest. We can also look at faces versus shoes. You get a little bit more activation. In general, as we see in this pattern, faces versus shoes is really robust. Um, positive, so greater face memory ability was associated with, again, that STS activation on both sides, and a little bit of frontal activation, and then worse face memory was associated with sort of a right motor region. Yeah, is this across everyone? Or? Yes, okay. across the whole sample. Um, and finally, the big question is how how does the EEG relate to the MRI? Right. So this is. Uh, measuring each individual N170 amplitude for faces, and then uh, correlating that with faces versus rest. And you get quite a robust uh, network actually on the left, which is a little bit surprising. So individuals who have a greater N170 show greater activation in the left, so the middle temporal gyrus, and you do get some bilateral FFA um, and some other frontal regions as well. And so to sort of summarize the MRI data, with this short experiment with naturalistic faces, inverted faces, and shoes, we elicit the beautiful uh, FFA and LSC activation as we would predict. They're somewhat reduced in autism, but no significant differences in threshold to face processing. The differences in individual autism severity as well as face perception and memory ability, as we saw, correlated with activation, and so this may explain some of those differences we see in other studies. Uh, and the N170 may be linked to sort of later face specific aspects of processing rather than general earlier visual processes. And so this is sort of the end of my data here, but I wish I had more to, I wish I could give this talk in two months closer to when I'm getting ready to leave because I still have a lot, a lot, a lot going on that's not ready yet. So we're looking at linking these trial by trial EEG fMRI, which is really why we wanted to do this. It's just not ready yet as we're still running subjects and still analyzing it. So hopefully we'll be able to link the individual fMRI trial to its corresponding EEG and see what those activations look like and what the sort of relationship is back and forth between EEG and fMRI. Also looking at function structure relationships, we have beautiful structural images and DTI that have been very carefully segmented for each individual. And as I mentioned before, analyzing the EEG fMRI correlations during resting state. Um, and so additionally, some other types of analyses, some sort of non-standard analyses using uh, machine learning and pattern classification. So there's so much more to come, and maybe I'll try to give another quick talk at a coffee social or something in the, later in the summer to update you on those. Um, but that's what happens when you give a talk three quarters of the way through your fellowship. Uh, so now to wrap up, I just want to acknowledge the, what an <coughs> excellent opportunity this has been, and how grateful I am to the Simons Foundation and to the Schwinn family for funding this project my advisors, John Gabrielli and Margaret Kelgard, to the huge team of researchers, many of whom are here today, who have helped me out with this, and to Rebecca and the team at the Simon Center here for making this such an excellent way to spend a couple of years and uh, extend my, the breadth of my research, and I've really learned a lot about autism, and uh, I'm really excited to continue in this direction in my next steps. So thank you all very much for your attention. tracking in the scanner and I would love to do eye tracking in the scanner however it ended up that the eye tracking rig that we have in the MRI would not fit in addition to the simultaneous EEG equipment that had to go in the bore of the scanner so I thought about trying to do it outside the scanner behaviorally but I think it's just a step for a future research I think it would be really interesting to also have that to correlate with the data and to ensure that the fixation was relatively similar so we can sort of take that out of the list of potential confounds it's a great question Right. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on how much, how many subjects you scanned? So you said you had 11 usable data 
videos as the autism group. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, how many did you scan in order to get there, and do you think that's a sufficient um, sample size? Sure. So most of the people that we scanned that we didn't end up using were more piloting to get the stimuli exactly how we want. So scanning folks from the lab in your ops and things like that. So all of the autism individuals that we scanned, except for one person's one run, we used their data. So AJ was great about helping us get individuals who had been scanned before and who would be relatively comfortable in the sort of more demanding situation. So we scanned six adults with autism, only one who's one run wasn't usable, the rest of the data are usable. And we've been trying to run an individual with autism and then find an appropriate match. And so for that reason, we're still collecting data. I would love to up this a little bit, but it's pretty encouraging that we get significant findings in such a small sample already. But yeah, I'd like to have it closer to 12 or 12 maybe to publish. Yes? The uh, added noise artifact from the ballistic cardiogram moving through the magnetic field there, that is a very uh, significant accomplishment that you've done, but uh, could you go into the filtration methods that you use to remove that noise a bit more? Yeah, so this is definitely, uh, I can tell you as much as I know about it, but it's not super uh, in my area of expertise. So the, the software that we use, and I mentioned the Brain Vision Analyzer that comes with the system is sort of, they have worked a lot on Elimina uh, eliminating those artifacts. So there's the first step of removing, the first step we visually inspect and remove any time, so there was a lot of motion affecting the data and things like that. And then there's sort of a two-step uh, scanner artifact removal that's sort of a click and drag type thing, so I'm not super familiar with it. Um, and then a removal of the pulse, or identifying the pulses so that you can remove the BCG, and then just sort of standard IAR filtering, uh, high pass and low pass. But happy to point you toward the more technical data on that if you're interested. So by explicitly matching uh, the two groups on the CFMT, are you setting yourself up for not finding differences? So, so, I mean, this is a methodological question. Sure. How would one go about looking for differences if you have selected the group from one of these uh, populations that is just as good at, at Right. So it would be ideal, I think, to be able to have, in the same way we have the same question about gender, right? So by excluding, you know, by matching on one thing, are we, the idea is to get sort of as a first pass, as close as we can to what's related to the etiology of autism versus no autism. Um, and I think that previous studies have found that face process, face uh, memory and perception really do relate to your brain activation and typical development. And so trying to understand if these differences we see in autism in the brain are related just to reduced, and there is a range, not everybody had, in, with autism has reduced um, perception and face memory. So I think we made the choice here to try and match on as much as we could that wasn't autism diagnosis as a first pass, and then it would be great to also have a group with autism or even a subgroup within and be able to compare high versus low uh, face perception and memory. Thanks, everyone.